Would you please be seated? Oscar Wilde, the famous Irish playwright, has been said, I can resist everything except temptation. <laughs> temptation. This is one of those um, sermons that is impossible to dodge. You see, my wife, she tells me that I preach the same sermon every week. She tells me that um, I always return to love, which I think is a compliment. In fact, much of um, kind of what, what I view the gospel and, and what I view that we're doing here is about kind of joining together with God and worship, giving thanks for all that we have and celebrating the incredible grace shed upon us. And so occasionally when I have to preach about something besides love, well, I just try to twist it just a little bit to make it about love. Temptation. Temptation is one of those topics. And in fact, um, I'm much more likely to talk about the great Motown, Motown band, The Temptations, than The Temptation of Christ. I could tell you how it was my dad's um, favorite tape in his little Volkswagen Rabbit. But instead, I'm going to talk about temptation, the temptation of Christ and our own temptation. We begin the season of Lent with this brief story in the Gospel of Mark of Jesus' 40 days in the wilderness where his only company is wild beasts and the angels that wait on him. And it's there just with this one word in this morning's Gospel where Jesus is simply tempted by Satan. Temptation, to be clear, is the name of the game for this morning's sermon and the topic that we'll be exploring this morning in the first Sunday of Lent. But yes, lest you be confused, the temptation we're talking about is the temptation to sin. Even worse, right? I started talking about temptation and now I'm going to talk about sin. Block the door. <laughs> we're Episcopalians after all. So let me begin by talking about what I see is sin. Sin for me is anything that keeps us out of relationship with God and each other. Anything that stands in the way of us truly understanding that we are connected with something greater than ourselves and with each other. There are personal sins, there are corporate sins, there are social sins, there are plenty of people who would sign up to tell you what your sins are. But I'm not gonna do that this morning. I trust that each of you has done some praying and considering what it is that keeps you apart from God and from your neighbor. Instead, I wanna talk about our temptation to sin. Now, it's not that temptation isn't central to our story. From the very genesis of our identity with Adam and Eve, Temptation is central part of the human story. We all know that story of that wily devil who tempts the pair by offering them a delicious bite of an apple that will give them what all of us want, which is knowledge, which is power. There's no surprise that they yield to the temptation. It is, in fact, the human story. It is our story. So by the time we get to Jesus in the desert, we recognize the challenge that this perfect God-man must overcome. Did you know that we call Jesus the second Adam? The translation of Adam in Hebrew is man, it's human. And so when we hear the story of Adam and Eve, what we're hearing is the story of humanity and its fall. And then by the time Jesus comes, we're called to understand the story anew. That the temptation that afflicted Adam and Eve is now laid upon our Lord and Savior there in the wilderness. In this lectionary cycle, 
which we call year B, we hear the version of the story of Jesus' trek into the wilderness from the Gospel of Mark. If you were here a few weeks ago, we talked about kind of some of the very specific things about the Gospel of Mark that that make it different from the other Gospels, and and two of them are on display this morning. One of them has to do with the immediacy with which all of this is happening, and the second is the incredible speed through which the Gospel of Mark takes us through Jesus' story. In just six verses this morning, six verses, verses, we see Jesus' baptism, we see his temptation in the wilderness, and we see Jesus' first preaching. These three little quick pericopes, these three little quick stories show Jesus' ministry as being inaugurated, and then he's tempted, and then he moves forward to tell the good news. And what's so interesting for this morning's topic about, about, about what was happening there in the desert is that there's nary a mention of the trials that he undergoes in the desert. Now, all of us who have been to church before, and especially in this first Sunday of Lent, know the story of Jesus' temptation in the wilderness. Or at least I hope you do. I'm going to remind you that the one version that I love the best comes from the Gospel of Matthew. In that version, the temptation that Jesus undergoes in the wilderness gets much more in-depth coverage. This is what Matthew says. Um, Then Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. And after 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. And the tempter came to him and says, If you are the Son of Man, command these stones to become loaves of bread. Of course, it's a good temptation, right? He's hungry. He's hungry. If you would ask my wife what I'm like if I haven't eaten for 12 hours, let alone 40 days, you can imagine that this temptation to feed his stomach has got to be unbelievable. But Jesus says, it is written, the man shall not live by bread alone, but by every good word that comes from the mouth of God. And then the devil took him to the holy city and set him on the pinnacle of the temple and said to him, if you are the son of God, throw yourself down. For it is written, he will command his angels concerning you and on their hands they will bear you up lest you strike your foot against a stone. What does God say? Through the person of Jesus, he said, you shall not put the Lord your God to the test. This test to be spectacular. This test to be powerful. And then, of course, there's the third temptation where the devil takes him up to a very high mountain and shows him all of the kingdoms of the world and their glory. And he says to him, all these I will give to you if you will fall down and worship me. The temptation for strength and might and riches And Jesus says to him, be gone, Satan, for it is written, you shall worship the Lord your God and serve only him. And then the devil left him, and behold, the angels came and were ministering to him. Which version of the story do you like better? The one where Jesus just simply goes into the the woods, into the wilderness, and is tempted and is joined by wild beasts and angels, or the one where we get to see what happens? I'm actually partial to this version, and there's a very particular reason why. It's probably the, the, the reason of the story that helps me understand it the easiest. In this great book called Dumb Super Communicators, Charles Duhigg argues that whenever we speak, we're actually participating in three conversations. Practical conversation, emotional conversation, or social conversation. The Gospel of Matthew, the one that I just read, leans heavily into the practical conversation. Who said what? What were the temptations? Where did this happen? I like that part of the world, right? Living in the practical conversations so that I can separate myself from what was happening to Jesus and what is happening to me. This morning's gospel and Mark is so spare, something else has to happen. You see, without all of those details that that Matthew and Luke provide, there's an opening there 
an opening that I find to be challenging, that forces us to move beyond the practical considerations of Jesus' temptation into our own emotional and social realms of conversation. When we think about temptation in the emotional sense, what it does then is it moves us outside of, of a mountaintop with, 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 with Jesus and Satan in this, in this ongoing conversation and moves it into a conversation about ourselves and about our world. How does temptation make us feel? It opens a question not about what Jesus was doing about temptation, but about what we are doing about temptation and why we are much more like Adam and Eve and their response than Jesus. You see, Adam and Eve were unwilling to live in the satisfaction that all that they had and all that they needed was provided for them. They wanted power and they wanted knowledge, and so do we. And Jesus, on the other hand, walked into that wilderness to confront the same invitation to those things and recognized that all he needed to do was turn to God. Isn't it easier to imagine us denying a meal than it is to imagine ourselves accessing how we truly feel when we're separate from God and each other? That's why I like Matthew, because it, because it lets me off the hook a little bit. But this morning's gospel is not meant to let us off the hook. This, this spare words allow us to be deeper and deeper invited into the conversation, the conversation that moves us beyond the question, beyond the question of the emotional response of what we're supposed to make of temptation and into the social one. You see, one of the things about temptation is, is that, that, it, that it's most likely to, to separate us from one another. That's what I find about sin, is that, is that when I'm sinning, I'm, I'm, I'm finding myself I'm both, both, both aware that, that it's not of God and further and further away from the people that I love. And so when we think about temptation and we move it into the social realm, we're forced to confront how societal pressures to achieve for wealth, for power, tempt us to reduce each other's humanity and in doing so, reduce ours. Temptation. I'd rather just keep the conversation about temptation in the practical realm, thank you very much. The temptation to have that extra um, serving of dessert is a lot easier to talk about than the ways in which the community that we live in is failing our neighbors. But Jesus' time in the wilderness was not for that. It was for him to consider how he would return and begin his ministry and walk them from the heights of the mountaintop to the cross in Jerusalem and ultimately to the resurrection on Easter morning. That in confronting the temptations that we face, all of a sudden Jesus turns this, this truth that we learned from Adam and Eve about brokenness and about distance from one another and about distance from God and allows us to move beyond that and into closer relationship with God and our neighbor. So thank God for temptation because it reminds us that we need each other and we need God. The task of this Lenten season is to think about sin, not just the practical things, but about the emotional and social things that come alongside of it. I invite you to use the tools that our prayer book suggests of prayer and almsgiving and fasting to confront sin, both corporate and personal, in order to prepare for the coming of our Lord on the blessed Easter morning. Do you want to know what the essence of temptation is? Do you want to know what the essence of temptation is? The essence of temptation is the invitation to live independently from God. We think we can do it alone. <laughs> 
and God proves to us over and over that we can't. And the season of Lent reminds us of that. And we take on practices that draw us closer to that truth. And so, may you be tempted. May you be tempted to recognize that you are not alone and that God is with you and that we need each other. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen.